Hello and welcome to Distillations, weekly extracts from the past, present, and future of chemistry. I'm Mayor Rindy. This week we're talking about the ancient art of alchemy. We'll learn the unfortunate fate of some early German alchemists and visit an alchemical exhibit at the Corning Museum of Glass. That's all coming up on today's episode of Distillations. Alchemy was originally the study and manipulation of matter, the search for a perfect substance. Early alchemists were rumored to know how to turn lead to gold, and their secret knowledge held out the promise of enlightenment, wealth, and immortality. Even today, alchemy conjures images of ingenious plans for life's biggest problems. Modern authors have adopted the word to explain everything from finance to race relations. Another, more subtle concept from the alchemical realm has also snuck its way into modern life. It's an idea that means exemplary, and it has its root in the labs and apothecaries of medieval alchemists. James Vogel has more in today's Element of the Week. Like the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, the quintessence started out as an ancient Greek concept. From the beginning, the quintessence, meaning the fifth essential thing, or fifth element, was considered an ethereal counterpart to the four basic elements. In the 13th and 14th centuries, Catalan alchemist Raymond Lull and the illustrious French Franciscan monk John of Rubicissa dedicated whole treatises to the quintessence, which had by then become known as a substance with miraculous healing powers. Alchemists believed that a quintessence had the power to heal and preserve bodies because it was the very thing that glued together the four elements, the building blocks of all matter. According to alchemists, every substance had its own quintessence. The quintessence of wine, for example, was alcohol. The quintessence of a plant or mineral was a distillate of its juices. The distillation of these quintessences kept alchemists and apothecaries busy in the 16th century, when medicine increasingly used alchemical methods for the production of balms, pills, and potions. Doctors often recommended these distillates for the treatment of everything from constipation to syphilis. As modern chemistry began to emerge from alchemical practice, the production of pharmaceuticals using elements from the periodic table and new man-made chemicals took the place of the search for the quintessence. What remains is the promise hidden in the term quintessential, an indication of quality and transformation, and a word sprinkled into ads for beauty products. And that's it for the Element of the Week. I'm James Vogel. James Vogel is Rare Books Curator at the Chemical Heritage Foundation. Life as an alchemist in the 16th century was not easy. There were many occupational hazards. Experiments could explode, fumes could overwhelm the alchemist's lungs, and self-experimentation with alchemically produced medicines could lead to all sorts of interesting and sometimes deadly ailments. And the risks for medieval alchemists went beyond the lab as well. The royal courts and social halls were often more dangerous, and an alchemist who crossed the wrong duke or duchess could end up swinging from the gallows. In the book Alchemy and Authority in the Holy Roman Empire, author Tara Numidal explores the social and political status of these early modern experimenters. CHF's Anka Timmerman has this review. For alchemists, the possibility of making the Philosopher's Stone was as real as the search for a cure for cancer is today. And just as we invest heavily into medical research, alchemists put all their faith and funds into alchemical experimentation. The best way for an alchemist to stay in business was to find a patron, a member of the gentry who would sponsor him. Not mere philanthropists, patrons had a clear personal interest in this investment. Once an alchemist found a universal medicine or produced a large amount of gold from base metals, The resulting wealth, health, and fame would belong to the patron. In the 16th and 17th centuries, many alchemists entered into these mutually beneficial relationships. But, as Tara Numedal shows in her book, Alchemy and Authority and the Holy Roman Empire, this arrangement could go terribly wrong. Numedal's book begins with the tale of a very unfortunate alchemist. More than 400 years ago, in an idyllic, affluent part of Germany, Duke Julius and Duchess Hedwig added alchemist Philipp Sömmering to their extensive staff. Sömmering had barely turned 35 
when his engagement came to a dramatic conclusion. Accused of theft, adultery, murder, sorcery and other spectacular crimes, the alchemist and his helpers were sentenced to death, tortured and quartered alive, and their bodies were displayed for all public to see, a common punishment for Renaissance frauds and liars. How did this happen? Did Zemmering really do something objectionable, or was he a victim to social perceptions? It turns out that Zemmering was hanging out with the wrong crowd. He was punished not for what he did, but for whom people believed him to be. You can read all the juicy details of the story and several other money-making schemes involving the Catholic Church, German dukes and ambitious alchemists in Numedal's book. The picture that emerges from Alchemy and Authority shows that alchemists were not just skilled craftsmen. They were entrepreneurs who needed good social skills, much charm, trustworthiness and a competitive spirit to save not only their livelihood, but also their lives. For Distillations, I'm Anke Timmerman. Anke Timmerman is Associate Director of the Beckman Center at the Chemical Heritage Foundation. Have comments or questions about something you've heard on our show? Send your thoughts to distillations at chemheritage.org. You're listening to Distillations. I'm Mayor Rindy. The Corning Museum of Glass in western New York is famous for its extensive collection of glassworks from across time and around the world. A recent exhibit focused on the glass of the alchemists, a peek into Baroque-era laboratories where new techniques change glass technology forever. Nina Goodby takes us on a tour. Alchemists have long gotten a bad rap as the magicians and witches of their day, but not everyone sees them like this. It wasn't eye of newt and a feather from the bird of paradise. It wasn't like that at all. What they brought to the field of glassmaking was a very serious and studied knowledge of the materials. The Glass of the Alchemist exhibit on display at the Corning Museum of Glass gives visitors a chance to rub elbows with marginalized 17th century alchemists. Mary Mills is the education director at the museum. When we planned this exhibition, there was a lot of discussion about the term alchemist. What we try to explain is that really the alchemists were the chemists of their day. Today we think of any major industrial company as having a research and development department. In the glass factories of the late 1600s, that duty rested in the hands of alchemists. They were able to put their time into experimentation where the people actually making the glass and working in the factories didn't have that luxury. Johann Rudolf Glauber was a German alchemist who did his research at a glass factory in Amsterdam. He designed and built furnaces that finally regulated temperature and developed techniques to purify raw materials. He also created a very special additive. Purple of Cassius was the step that people had been looking for. It's the only way gold can be used in glass making. To create Purple of Cassius, Glauber mixed nitric acid, hydrochloric acid, and tin, and then added gold particles, so tiny and light that they remained suspended in the solution. The Purple of Cassius was then stirred into a batch of glass, and the gold spread evenly throughout. In Europe in the late 17th century, glassmakers were trying very hard to create new experimental types of glass. The Italians had been producing thin, fragile Cristallo glass since the 13th century, but glassmakers all over Europe wanted something sturdier, stronger, and aesthetically unique. The man at the center of this mission was George Ravenscroft. He found that adding more lead stopped the glass from crizzling or cracking apart. Ravenscroft's lead glass is what we say is glass with a cold gray clarity. Because of its durability, lead glass was the first step towards the tumblers and wine glasses we drink from today. At the time that all of these glasses were developed, the average person would have been lucky to even have glass windows. It wasn't until the development of lead glass that we had mainstream tableware for the common person. Common, that is, if you consider a castle a common home. Owning glassware was still a symbol of status, especially if you had a piece of glass the color of twinkling rubies. Gold ruby glass is credited to Johann Kunkel, a German pharmacist and the son of a glassmaker. 
Kunkel made gold ruby glass with the aid of Glauber's Purple of Cassius. Throughout history, glassmakers have tried to imitate precious stones. For Kunkel to be able to make this beautiful, just incredibly gorgeous red glass that truly is the color of rubies, this was very special and it was very new. Today, the influence of these alchemists is easy to overlook. You can literally buy bars of color and just chop off what you want, put it on the end of a clear bubble, and make any color in glass you want, where these people couldn't do that. They were making all of their color from scratch. Here at the Corning Museum of Glass, alchemists are given a proper nod as the scientists and inventors they were. And the magic they created can be clinked together over your next celebratory meal. For Distillations, I'm Nina Goodby. Nina Goodby is a radio producer, writer, and folklorist. She lives in New York City. You can learn more about the Corning Museum of Glass at cmog.org. You can see illustrations from CHF's vast collection of alchemical books on our website, distillations.chemheritage.org. And that's it for this week's episode of Distillations. Distillations is a presentation of the Chemical Heritage Foundation and is made possible by the generous support of the Richard Lounsbury Foundation. Mia Lobel is our senior producer. Our associate producer is Victoria Indaviro, and our executive producer is Audra Wolf. Our theme music is composed and performed by Dave Kaufman. Additional music provided from the Podsafe Music Network. Check it out at music.podshow.com. Please tell us what you think about our program and send suggestions for future shows to distillations at chemheritage.org. Until next time, I'm Mayor Rindy.